It's Saturday evening, and you're only a third of the way through your sixth shift in seven days. You're on your way to see a 28-year-old patient, known very well to your department, who's here yet again for a request for more Percocet. You prepare yourself for yet another challenge when suddenly overhead you hear, Attention, attention, code lavender, ED break room. Your mind starts to race through the codes you know, from most terrifying to least. Pink, blue, red. Sure, you're a little sleep deprived, but what the heck is a code lavender? On your way, you're scrambling for what to bring for this unknown emergency. Should I bring an ultrasound, some push dose pressors, a chest tube kit? Your heart rate is now easily over 100. You do the characteristic run slash walk you use to head to a code blue. You fly through the door to the ED break room and your jaw drops. Instead of the sound of a monitor in a systole, you hear music. Instead of floating a catheter, you see floating balloons. Instead of frenzied expressions, you see smiles. You exhale. You've completely forgotten that the nurses are throwing a retirement party for one of your all-time favorite nurses. Welcome to the Emergency Medicine Cases Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Anton Hellman, bringing you Canada's brightest minds in emergency medicine from EMC Studios in Toronto. Code Lavender may seem flippant at first blush, but it's a clever response to a real problem. A Code Lavender signifies a wellness opportunity whether it be a food break, a celebration of a team member's excellent performance, or even a puppy petting break. These are all real examples of healthcare professionals recognizing that in general, we do an excellent job taking care of patients, but a poor job of taking care of ourselves. Today in the podcast, we'll be diving into the increasingly topical world of physician wellness. For years, physicians have worn difficulty, work conditions, a huge emotional burden, and crushing hours as a badge of honor. I'm relieved to say that the days of bravado are slowly drawing to a close. This is thanks in no small part to professionals like our guest today, Chris Trevelyan, an educator and counselor at the University of Toronto's Office of Resident Wellness. Welcome, Chris. Thank you. And Sarah Gray, who you've probably heard on the podcast before, a double certified doc in EM and intensive care from St. Michael's Hospital in Toronto, and my old study buddy from undergrad. Welcome back to EM Cases, Sarah. Thanks, Anton. Happy to be here. Great. So in the podcast, we're going to discuss why wellness matters in the first place, how you can strive to achieve it, individual strategies like compassion exercises, for example, system strategies like what your ED and hospital can do. To promote wellness, and most importantly, how to recognize when you or a colleague are unwell and how to help. So let's get started. First, Sarah, why does wellness really matter? I mean, why should we care about this as emergency physicians and trainees? So wellness is a huge issue in emergency medicine, in parts because our burnout rates are so high. They're higher than the general population, and they're also higher than the other medical specialties. And burnout causes or leads to a vast array of problems. It leads to medical problems like coronary artery disease or hypertension. It can lead to a whole host of psychological sequelae like depression, anxiety, addiction, or marital conflict, family conflict. But it's also associated with professionalism issues. So burnout impacts how we work every day and can lead to increased medical error and worse quality of care. So I think in general, the more well we are, not only better for our patients, but also better for us as individuals. I understand that the suicide rates for physicians are actually higher than the general population. Is that true? Absolutely. And that's also true within emergency medicine specifically. Our suicide rates are really high, and I would argue unacceptably high. The rate of suicide for female physicians is actually twice that of the general population. Wow. That's a scary kind of number. So I guess if you flip it around, Sarah and Chris, in terms of the, all these horrible statistics about how burnout is terrible, I suppose if you flip that around and say, 
wellness would actually decrease suicide rates, would be better for our patients, decrease medical error, improve our professionalism. Absolutely. Wellness helps us be the doctors we always wanted to be. Well said. All right. And I'm actually really just curious from both of you how you became interested in wellness in the first place. So I think while I was training and through, you know, the beginning of my career, I had always known some colleagues with burnout here and there and had had a few rushes with that myself. And then a few years ago, one of my closest friends committed suicide, which was a really shocking event in my life. He was a marvelous, smart, successful person, but also a perfectionist. And when he went through some really challenging life circumstances, he was overwhelmed. And then the following year, we had a second friend who also died from suicide. And these two events just changed my whole outlook. I realized that I needed to live differently and interact with my friends and family differently. And I think prior to that, perfection had always sort of been my goal. But I realized there had to be something better to strive for. And maybe that something is wellness or balance or connection. But shifting that mindset came out of these horribly tragic life events. A few years ago, I started working with undergraduate medical students as a counselor as they were going through their first four years of medical training. And in that time, I became increasingly concerned with the systems challenges that the trainees were facing. And since I've begun work in postgraduate medical ed- education, those concerns with the organizational and the systems factors have continued. I work with people one-on-one in supporting them in their resilience and their navigation of their training and their work. But in doing so, I've also been leading workshops related to resilience and wellness. As I've been doing those workshops, I've been having to confront in the narratives of the people that I work with systems issues that need to be addressed if we're going to make any headway in supporting physician wellness. And I think that touches on my own social work background, which looks at the person in context. And rather than just addressing the individual and trying to skill up physicians to support them to manage the challenges of their work. We need to address some of those challenges at the source. All right. So, yeah, we're going to be talking lots about individual and system strategies to improve wellness. Let's talk a little bit more about burnout and trying to kind of define exactly what we're talking about. I hear the word burnout thrown around a lot. I think it's important to define exactly what we're talking about because burnout may mean different things to different people. So what exactly is burnout and what are the signs that we should be able to recognize in our colleagues and ourselves that burnout has taken hold? One of the things that needs to be kept in mind about burnout is that it's truly occupationally focused. And that's one of the ways it's differentiated from depression, for example. And so the telltale signs of burnout have to do with one's relationship to their work. So there's a sense of emotional exhaustion a sense of depersonalization or or a sense of alienation from or cynicism toward others, specifically around one's engagement in work, a reduced personal accomplishment, a sense that uh, the work doesn't have the same meaning and you're not getting the same sense of reward from it. There's one measure for burnout that simply asks people if they are feeling more callous. And a measure of callousness is a measure of the engagement that people are bringing. And the opposite of burnout is a sense of vigor, a sense of engagement, a sense of enthusiasm and meaning. What percentage of emergency physicians or physicians in general are actually burnt out or report being burnt out at least? One of the challenges in the Canadian context is that almost all of the data we rely on is from the United States. Soon this is going to be remedied by the Canadian Medical Association's 2017 National Physician Health Survey, which is going to be released soon and will have some good data on burnout. In the United States, consistently over the last decade, the numbers are somewhere in the realm of 50% of practicing physicians are experiencing burnout. Burnout exists on a spectrum, right? All the way from you have a moment or two in your shift where you feel burnt out to you have a year of dreading going to your shift every day and hating every second of it and having both health and psychological impact from that burnout. 
And so I think when we do measure this, rates are very high because we are catching people all along that spectrum. And I think the important thing is recognizing that we all fall on that spectrum at times and learning how to move yourself back to the healthier side of it. So maybe you're only having a moment or two of cynicism during your day rather than a month of intense cynicism. Before we get into the strategies to stave off burnout and promote wellness, I think it's important to understand some of the key contributors. So let's start with the key contributors to burnout stemming from the individual. So Sarah, what other individual factors contribute to burnout? In other words, who's at the highest risk for burnout? Sure. So when we look at individual factors, I think a huge one is the fact that We have such a significant responsibility in our job in the emergency department. We have life and death outcomes and the highest possible consequences for our actions. Second, we work under really relentless time pressures. There aren't too many jobs where you may not have a chance to eat or drink or use the bathroom on your shift, but that is a common occurrence in the emergency department. We also have ongoing difficult interactions at work, sometimes both with patients, but also with other teams and colleagues. And I think that leads to a really significant interpersonal stress that we certainly think contributes to burnout. And then emergency workers can have the same financial worries that other people have. And lastly, I would mention that shift work has a significant impact on our home lives, on how we interact with our families and spend time with our families or stay awake to spend time with our families, that we can't discount how difficult it can be to merge the life of a shift worker with the lives of people who do not work shifts. Okay, for those medical students listening, don't be scared away from emergency medicine. We're going to soon give you strategies to to fight these things. (laughs) One of the other contributors to burnout is medical error. You know, no one likes to screw up, especially since most of us, you know, did pretty well to get into medical school and we have very high expectations of ourselves. Sarah, before we were talking about the perfectionist type personality, there's a lot of us uh, in medicine with perfectionist personalities. Let's talk specifically about how one reacts to medical error and how that can contribute to burnout. Sure. So I think many doctors are perfectionists at baseline. Certainly, we're all high achievers. And then we train into this culture that tells us that work is more important than family life, that work can be more important than sleeping or eating. And this culture also promotes the idea that failure is weakness and that weakness is shameful. And all of these factors lead to us not talking about medical error. We keep quiet about it and almost hope that no one finds out. But when we stay silent, we feel isolated and ashamed, and we lose the chance to realize that other people have been there too. We lose that opportunity to reach out for connection and support. And so... I mean, there is evidence about this that when physicians are involved in a serious medical error case, 50% of those physicians report increased anxiety for future errors, decreased confidence in their job, and overall decreased job satisfaction. And additionally, this can lead people on to insomnia or post-traumatic stress, panic disorders. There can be really serious consequences after we experience a medical error. I think the issue of medical error seems to be a critically important one to address within uh, the community and within the system because, in fact, many physicians have a very hard time recovering from the experience of a medical error for some of the reasons Sarah has mentioned, that sense of isolation, a sense of shame. And, in fact, there's three different outcomes that have been talked about in the literature around the aftermath of medical error. The first would be what is called dropping out, and that's something that many physicians afterward do consider is whether they want to go on in their current role or within medicine more broadly. 
And then there are those who are described as surviving, having found a way to continue in their work without feeling like they've truly recovered or moved on. And then finally, there's more and more literature on this idea of thriving after something like a medical error, which picks up on the post-traumatic growth literature, which tries to see it as a traumatic experience that can be integrated and used for further learning and for further leadership around perhaps that topic or around medical error more broadly. We're going to talk a lot more about medical error a little bit later, but just continuing with the factors that contribute to burnout, let's shift from the individual factors, which we've just talked about, medical error, et cetera, to systems contributors to burnout. The more aware we are of the systems issues, I think the better able we are to stave off burnout and promote wellness. So Chris, Can you explain to our listeners how some of the key systems issues in EM contribute to burnout? Well, I think the first thing we need to look at is the fact that over time, in general, within within medical practice, it seems, and it seems the same would be true of emergency medicine, that the ratio of workload to worker has increased and systems pressures on the individual worker have become increasingly challenging. And the complexity of cases has increased, the complexity of the biomedical knowledge has increased. And so the burden of responsibility that physicians hold within their work in the current system seems to be increasing steadily as we have resource challenges and more and more expectations for what type of care is delivered. I would also just echo something that Chris just said in that many of us now work with governments or policy systems that track certain metrics. And those metrics may or may not relate to what we believe is quality medical care. And I find one of the big drivers of disengagement at my place is working hard to achieve these arbitrary metrics that are then reported on to your executives and your governments that don't actually necessarily relate to delivering excellent care. Sometimes I feel like we are pushed to work hard for the wrong outcome. And that is a big driver to disengagement. I also find from a system level that the amount of data or medical knowledge we have now is overwhelming for people. And certainly when I was training, there was this vision of you would train and grow up to be that omniscient doctor in the lab coat who knew everything and who didn't have to look anything up and had all of the answers at their fingertips. You mean Walter Himmel? <laughs> it, could be, it could be Walter Himmel. It could be Osler. It could be, you know, whoever that was. But I think now the body of medical knowledge is exploding so fast that that has literally become impossible. But we weren't trained to think that the ideal doctor is constantly looking things up and cross-checking their facts or looking for the latest evidence. But that, in fact, I think is what we need to become. But in the meantime, it is challenging for people to role model that person who is an excellent doctor but doesn't know everything. Because I think we, in fact, now can't know everything. And the best doctors are the ones who are constantly studying and looking things up and who aren't ashamed on shift in front of their house staff to say, oh, let's just Google for that latest RCT and cross-check those numbers. Because I think that is the new reality, and we need to start teaching that as our ideal doctor rather than this mythical person who happens to have it all locked down in their head because that myth is no longer achievable. I thought you knew everything, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> no, That's I know. Why I had you on the podcast. <laughs> oh dear! Okay, now I'm going to be kicked off home. the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I think this raises a really important point that's obviously relevant for staff physicians, but also very relevant for trainees. And there's in the performance arts educational literature, there's a distinction made between performance cultures and learning cultures. And a learning culture is one in which someone is supported to be a learner in an open way. I think in medicine, it seems that people often are expected to do their learning furtively, you know, somehow in advance of their time on the job at work. 
and somehow to show up having done all their learning already. Whereas, of course, that's not the case, certainly not for trainees, but with the ongoing increasing acceleration of knowledge and the ongoing continuing medical education, all physicians are faced with being learners in an ongoing sense. And I think this question of to what extent do senior physicians reveal themselves to be learners it sets a tone for the entire medical culture and for the trainees as well, which makes it permissible to not already know any everything in advance. And that's a role modeling that establishes that learner culture, which is akin to what's discussed as a growth mindset towards learning. Rather than thinking that we're supposed to have already figured things out, that we can see mistakes, we can see gaps in knowledge as opportunities for growth and opportunities for learning. And in my experience working with trainees, that shift from an expectation that one should already know to one of looking at learning as an ongoing accomplishment of growth can set a huge shift in terms of how someone is dealing with the challenges and the burden of their ongoing work. And my last thought Anton, isn't related to medicine in particular, but more to society at large, that I think social media just shines a light on our communities in a whole different way that didn't exist when I was young. I'm Oh, dear. I'm dating myself. Scratch that bit up. Uh, in a way that well, didn't exist age, before. So I, I can relate to that. Uh, <laughs> but now, you know, everybody has a their Facebook or Instagram or Twitter feed, whatever it is. And those feeds are relentlessly marvelous and positive. And look at that amazing vacation and look at that picture-perfect moment And for people who are feeling isolated or ashamed to look out into this social media world, it looks like everybody else's life is marvelous. People don't post their medical errors on Facebook. And this sets up a real disconnect between this external world we're showing to people through our internet lives and our actual honest personal lives. But I think that that impact of social media really contributes to people not wanting to share honest mistakes or medical errors. One of the other things that comes up in the literature and in my conversations with practicing physicians and trainees is the sense that the community of support in a physical space sense has been challenged in the last few decades. There's a loss of physician lounges. There's a loss of common space for people to come together and share in a sense of camaraderie and support on the job. And there's some indication that although duty hours have reduced, the time that people spend at work is experienced as less supportive than it was experienced as many years ago where people were actually on the job for longer, but there was more of a sense of supporting one another while at work. Mm -hmm. Whereas now there's a sense people go to work and do work and they get all their support needs met outside of work. And it's broken down that sense of community that at one time was discussed more in, in medical cultures. And I think some say that that's increased the sense of isolation people have on the job. Now, hopefully we haven't depressed our listeners with uh, all the contributors to burnout. So now we're going to try and flip things around and, and try and come up with some solutions, both on the individual level and on the systems level, to promote wellness. So let's start with the individual strategies. So we're going to cover seven strategies. First is the notion of failing up. There's how to take care of yourself, self-compassion training, mindfulness, resilience, engagement, and finally sleep hygiene. Sarah, in your fantastic talk that you gave at the EMU conference and at U of T's Whistler conference earlier this year, you introduced the concept of failing up. You know, we spend a lot of time and energy in emergency medicine talking about how to be a great doc, discussing the latest evidence. You know, we love to talk about our great saves and that sort of thing. But we don't really talk about our failures very often. We don't talk about our medical errors very often, as we were saying. We don't talk about our disaster cases and all our screw-ups, which, of course, if you've been practicing long enough, we've all had to deal with. So, Sarah, what do you mean by failing up? So for me, this concept, I guess, circles back to what Chris was saying about 
how we can thrive after failure or the concept of post-traumatic growth. I think we are all human, and part of that means we are all going to make mistakes. That means every single person I know makes mistakes, whether you work in the emergency department or not. But when we don't talk about it and when we sweep those failures under the rug, we miss an opportunity to heal from them effectively. We can't learn from them as effectively, and we can't teach other people about them to nearly the same degree. And so if we can start to accept the fact that we will fail and incorporate that as part of our everyday life and role modeling, we can then start teaching people how to grow from those failures and how to thrive after failure more effectively. Because the best way to teach this to our trainees is to role model it for them on the ground in the middle of your shift. And we have to move our culture to the level where people are confident enough to do that effectively. And then to teach our new generation of trainees how to continue that path. I kind of see when a big mistake or a medical error is made, I kind of feel like a physician has three choices. And two of the choices are sort of the natural path that most people would go down that actually end up being totally maladaptive. And the third choice is the one that actually takes a lot of effort where you can actually learn from it and become more well, essentially. So the first option you have after making a big mistake or having a medical error incident is basically to live in perpetual doubt. You know, you blame yourself and then you end up, unfortunately, practicing defensive medicine so that every patient that you see with the same complaint that you made the mistake about or something you know, you'll order a billion tests and over-investigate and just practice this defensive medicine, which is really not a good choice for many reasons. You know, one of which is that defensive medicine has not only been shown to increase the cost and length of stay, but actually result in worse patient outcomes. You know, maybe you've seen your colleagues do this sort of thing. The second option is to kind of bury your head in the sand. You know, you just blow off your medical error, you look the other way, you shrug it off, And, you know, this isn't a great choice either because inevitably you end up becoming kind of a hardened, ruthless emergency provider and end up not really caring about what happens to your patients. You know, maybe you've seen this in your colleagues over the years as well. And these first two choices, you know, this living in perpetual doubt or burying your head in the sand, they're, again, sort of the natural paths that most docs take, probably because they don't really take much effort. But then there's the third choice that does take a bit of effort, but is almost certainly the best choice. And that is, like you were saying, to learn from your fail. You know, this takes, again, a lot of effort, consideration, and time, but it's worth it because learning from your mistake makes you more accountable, compassionate, and competent, actually. In fact, one of the main reasons I started EM Cases way back in 2010 was because I wanted to learn as much as I could about some bad outcome cases that I had. So that's a bit about a general way of thinking about medical error and failing up. What are the things we can actually do in order to fail up well? So the first step for me is to accept that it will happen, to accept that we are all going to make mistakes, that this is inevitable no matter how hard you train or study or learn. We are not perfect and that it will happen. And then the second step for me is then to learn how to talk about it. I mean, that sounds easy, but right. I, that and is tough to do. When you've just made yeah. a medical error, again, your first, your first reaction is like not tell anyone. Absolutely. So how, do, how do you actually right? do that? Denial and repression are our go-tos, right? Just keep your mouth shut. Don't tell anybody. Maybe it'll go away. Yeah, it's actually, you know, this is a step that sounds so easy, but is actually psychologically so difficult because you need to have somebody you trust who will listen. And that, for me, really is the key thing. And so I started doing this a few years back. I've been talking about this at a number of conferences this year. But I think everybody needs to find themselves a failure friend. And this is your go-to person you can talk to when you've screwed up. You want to think a little bit before you choose them. You need to choose somebody kind. You need to choose somebody who likes you, who will give you a compassionate response back. 
I can and, I can imagine how that could buy. Yeah, right. Don't choose you. somebody <laughs> mean or judgmental. It's ideal if you choose someone who understands your context. And so for me, I have a failure friend in the emergency department. I have one for my work in the ICU, and I have several for my work as a parent because the toughest of all. Th- jobs. That's my toughest <laughs> job by far, or possibly just the job I am least well trained for. But whatever it is, I need a lot of support there. But then the issue is to go to these friends that sometimes take a little while to develop that relationship. But the key is you don't need to talk to them about the medical details. We're actually pretty good at that. And you can have M&M rounds at work. That's fabulous. But the hard part is to go and talk to them about how you feel, to go and tell them when you feel like a terrible doctor or when you feel like a failure or when you feel like quitting, to go and talk to that person and then have them lean back in and say, wow, I've been there too. We can work through this together. We are in this as a community. That moment of support is incredibly valuable. And I used to say to people, you know, you don't have to tell your friend that they're your failure friend because you don't want to make it awkward, right? So you don't you don't be like, hi, will you be my failure friend? It's a bit weird. But actually, as I've been speaking about this to more and more people this year, it's an amazing topic because people are so engaged with it. They will call me or email me or DM me to tell me their experience. You're the failure friend of like 400 <laughs> no, people out no, there. No, thank You're... goodness. I'm, I'm not. You're getting but an I'm... email every five minutes. <laughs> Can you imagine? Sarah, help me. I had no, this horrible case. No, because I'm not that good at it. But they're all sharing their experience. And so many of them have said that just the act of going to a friend and deciding to be each other's failure friend has been very powerful for them. For them to identify with a friend, like, hey, if I have a really bad case, can I come to you? And if you have one, you can come to me. And for them to contract with each other that it's okay and safe to have this discussion has been really powerful for all of these people. So even if they haven't actually had to use this support network Just laying that foundation for potentially having a conversation down the road has made them feel more supported. And so they're building that network in advance so that if they go through a difficult case, they have the people there waiting to support them, to catch them when they're having a rough day. And that, I think, is something that anybody can do, regardless of the specifics of their job or their level of training. There's a great pearl. Mm-hmm. Great. I mean, that's it's so simple, but so effective. I mean, I, I can tell you from, again, personal experience. So in terms of what you do in order to fail up well, so to speak, you're accepting that you're going to fail. We all make mistakes. You're learning how to talk about it. You find yourself a failure friend. Is there anything else you can do to fail up well, so to speak? Sure. So, you know, sometimes for people Maybe there are terrible cases today, and they haven't had that time to build themselves a network of failure friends yet. This is where roles like Chris's become so valuable. More and more places have offices of wellness with counselors or educators or therapists there. So I always encourage people that that is a totally excellent resource for people to access. Or if they don't want to go to whatever is their local office for wellness, if they have one, that people can also go to a therapist. Therapists are trained to give you empathy and compassion and reflective listening and all of these amazing things that we need if you have all of these difficult feelings that you just need to talk about and get through. I was just at the Lady Gaga concert with my kids the other day and in front of, I don't know, 30,000 people or whatever it was, she was talking about her therapist in front of 30,000 people. Mm -hmm. So if Lady Gaga (laughs) can talk about going to a therapist in front of 30,000 people, you know, an emergency physician should feel very comfortable. Yeah. So can the rest of us. Yeah. Right. I mean, I've gone to two different therapists at times in my life and I don't have a psychiatric diagnosis. I don't take any meds, but these are a huge resource 
I know there's all this stigma around this in medicine and that people are very reluctant to do this, but that's crazy. Our mental health is just as valuable as all of the other aspects of our health. And if I had diabetes, I would go see an endocrinologist. Uh, If I had cholecystitis, I would go to a specialist and get my gallbladder out. Like, for me to not access a mental health professional when I'm having a mental health issue is, it's ridiculous. Like, right? We need as a community to be way smarter than that. We are way smarter than that. We just need to break through that ridiculous stigma and access the resources we need to stay healthy. I want to get back to a second about the failure friend. I think this is a great concept. If you're a failure friend, Sarah, to someone else, how do you best do that? Because, you know, it's kind of easy to go and ask someone to be your failure friend. But how do you kind of reciprocate? Like, what's a good failure friend? Okay. So I think the first key is to just listen really hard and to keep your mouth shut about yourself. Like to maintain the focus of the conversation on the other person. It's interesting that you say that. We were just talking in our podcast on teaching on shift. Mm -hmm. And one of the first things that Alma Matu said was just shut up and let the learner talk. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Just let that person talk until you've heard all of their experience. And maybe in their You know, if there's a pause in the conversation, you could ask a question or you could ask them to clarify something or you could reflect back to them something you heard that you thought you might want to hear more about. But the first step is really just giving them the space to say everything they need to say. And that, I find it hard. You know, as an emergency doctor, I'm sorry, but we're so time pressured at work. We interrupt patients all the time. We cut people off. We interject with our agenda rather than theirs. So I just sit and remind myself to keep my mouth shut while they have a go. And then I think if I'm going to start talking at all, it needs to be an expression of either empathy, which is I hear what you're going through. I've been there, too. We are in this together. You are not alone. Those, for me, are all expressions of empathy. The other way to go is with expressions of validation. Like, I understand how you're feeling. It makes sense to me that you're having all of these things go on after this case. That is totally legit. That would happen to other people who are in this scenario. And just validating their experience Excuse me, and how difficult their experience is for them in that moment. And then asking them what else they need. Sometimes people just need a space to talk and feel heard and feel validated. And that that alone is what they need. Sometimes they need to come back again and talk to you a week later. Perfect. No problem. It's important to let the other person set the agenda. I don't need to give them advice. I don't need to tell them what to do. I can't fix their problem for them. That needs to be all left in their realm. I'm just there to listen. Yeah, it's a challenging thing to do because as emergency physicians, of course, we're trained to give advice and help people and do something now. Mm -hmm. So that, I imagine, takes a bit of practice. Yeah, don't fix their problem. Mm -hmm. That's key. Those are some of the ways of choosing a failure friend and being a failure friend. What about in terms of sharing your failures in a group situation? What kind of things can we do there? How can we, for example, change our M&M rounds so that it helps the physician who's giving the M&M rounds to actually feel better about the situation? So I think we've made some strides in the right direction there, Anton. You do see more of an evolution of M&Ms towards looking at challenging cases and both identifying individual factors or physician factors that may have led to the outcomes, but also looking at system failures or system issues that contributed. And I think the goal there is to reduce that sense of blame that people feel when they're disclosing a difficult case. And I think that's a valuable way to look at it, But I actually still think it misses the important psychological piece that's there. We say, oh, our M&Ms, you know, aren't about blame and judgment. 
But really, many people still leave thinking, wow, that was a terrible case. I'm glad that didn't happen to me. I'm glad it was that other guy. I almost wish we also had a psychological component to our M&Ms, although I realize this is a pipe dream and probably most people in the medical community (laughs) won't want to adopt this. But I wish we could also talk about what the personal impact was for the people involved in the case and how they worked through their recovery. Because I think talking about that piece of it would also be really valuable for us. Like, not only do we need to change our system to better support our healthcare workers, but we also need to learn these personal strategies of how are people moving through this. And I think when we don't talk about it in M&Ms, we keep that culture of silence and denial and repression going. In fact, there's been some headway in this direction because there's something called the Schwartz Rounds, which was developed in Boston and has been adapted for different contexts where people come together and do focus on the emotional and psychological aspects of their experience around a medical error or an adverse outcome. And the purpose there is exactly, as you say, Sarah, to take away the sense of blame and to try to open up a safer place to look at those often unspoken aspects of the emotional experience and to ask people to give some narrative of what they went through subjectively, not just around the medical aspects or the procedural aspects of the adverse outcome, but to specifically tell a story that has to do with what they did, how they felt, what supports they sought, what that experience was like. So it's much more process oriented about the subjective experience of the people who were were part of that incident. And from my own experience, actually, of talking about cases that I've been sued over, total disaster cases, it took me about 15 years to be able to gather up the courage to actually do a full rounds on dealing with horrible cases. Mm -hmm. I did these rounds in North York General, and I was just amazed first at, I've given dozens and dozens of talks, and I've never had an audience so glued to every word I was saying because they were just completely blown away that I was actually talking about these terrible cases that I had, which was interesting to think that, again, that's this culture that people just don't feel comfortable doing this. But on the flip side, first of all, it made me feel way better just be able to get, get up there and talk about it. And then the icing on the cake was actually that after the round, a colleague of mine came up to me and said, you know what, Anton, that was amazing that you were able to do that. I had this amazing case. Can I tell you about it? That it was a total disaster, you know? So, mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, Anton, I've had exactly the same experience. And so over the past year, I've given multiple talks about failure. And usually in there somewhere, I tell the audience a number of my worst cases or the cases that haunt me. And the rooms get so quiet. You know, one of them was a room with almost a thousand people in it. And I swear you could have heard a pin drop because people just aren't used to having this conversation. But afterwards, the people who come up to talk to you are so engaged and they've been there too. And people are moved just by having that conversation opened. Afterwards, I feel so much better. Because there is that support from our community, if you just open the door to the conversation, other people want to walk through and engage with that. Yeah, I suppose the more and more talks like yours and mine are given out there, the more comfortable the audience will feel to engage and share their experiences. Next on our list of individual strategies to prevent burnout and promote wellness is taking care of yourself. Some of us end up working so much taking care of others, our patients, our kids, our parents that, you know, we forget about ourselves. So Sarah, what are some strategies you suggest for taking care of yourselves? What do you do to take care of yourself? So my first strategy for people is always for them to figure out what brings them inner peace and then make sure they do a lot of that. So for me, I have a few things that work for me. I like to run, uh, so exercise is really important for me. I like reading novels. 
So if I can just find 20 minutes in a day to read like a non-medical book somewhere that has a huge impact on my overall serenity. And people need to do a bit of self-examination to figure out what works for them. I think it's different for everybody. But making sure that you have little moments for yourself in every day is one of the really valuable ways to take care of yourself. And then I always tell people, that protecting time for themselves is incredibly valuable. And that, for me, takes – there are a few different formats. One is just making time to go to the birthday parties, making time to go to your kid's event, or even just to play soccer on the lawn. To prioritize those celebrations highly is valuable, right? Don't skip the birthday party to study. You need those moments of joy in your life to balance out the difficult times. And the other concept around this that I really like, last year on MRAP, and I'm sorry, I've forgotten who the author was or who the experts were on this piece, but they were talking about the concept of a schedule hack, which is where in your calendar every week, you put in an hour or two, which is your protected time to have fun. And then you protect that time like mad. You protect it just as fiercely as you would protect time for your shifts or the other things that you're going to do. And you can either just put, you know, schedule hack in your calendar and have on the day you decide what you're going to do, or you can make it more specific. You know, in that hour, I'm going to get a massage. In that hour, I'm going to have lunch with a girlfriend, whatever it may be. But I do this now, and it's really great. Now when I look at my calendar, it's not just work, 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 pay the bills, do more work, run some errands. I look at my day and I'm like, oh, I have a schedule hack today. What do I get to do in that hour? And it's only, I do one hour a week. Like it's really, it's pretty small. I'm not talking about a major time investment, but now every time I look at that day in the calendar, I get a little hit of joy. It really makes my whole outlook much brighter. Making that hour on a weekly basis, a commitment to yourself It's a really small time investment that can have long-lasting benefits on your wellness. All right. I want to shift gears a little bit now and talk a little bit about how to say no. So I'll tell you what I'm talking about. So when EM Cases was ramping up, I started getting all kinds of invitations to like be on committees and give talks and write articles, all kinds of stuff. And for a while, I was saying yes to everything. It was so exciting and I was all engaged and it was great work. But if I was kind of honest to myself, my family life really did start to suffer because I was just like working like a maniac. You know, then my wife kind of sorted me out, you know, sorted me straight kind of thing. (laughs) And then I started to learn how to say no to some of these requests that I was getting. You know, now I'm much more selective about what I take on. And as a result, I'm much happier. Is there sort of a a kind of script or just approach to saying no, Sarah, that you would suggest to our listeners? Because it's really hard to say no, especially when someone who's, you know, important in your field or something is asking you to do something. You don't want to let them down. Absolutely, right? Someone asks you to a meeting and that's the same hour you had scheduled your schedule hack. You know, what do you do then? And we're not trained how to say no in medicine, right? That's not our culture. But it is an important part of learning how to set your boundaries to protect your time. So, and I mean, I don't know, I'm not sure I should be your expert on this, Anton, because frankly, I'm not very good at saying no. But when I do it, I try to remember what my important priorities are that I'm protecting. And then I keep it short and I keep it kind. I just say, thank you so much for the invitation. I'm afraid I'm not able to make it, period. You don't have to give a reason. You don't have to give a long explanation. If you really don't want to go to the meeting or that committee, don't add the, oh, maybe next time I'll be free, because that, you know, softens your no, but also leaves the door open to you getting asked again the following month. It is okay to just say no. And probably easier for whoever the other person is who's trying to organize their committee and really only wants a group of people who are going to be engaged and committed. I'm honored that you didn't say no to doing this podcast. It means that this is a very high priority for you, Sarah. 
I think people like yourselves, Anton and Sarah, are an important position to model saying no, because my experience speaking with trainees is that they have not gotten to where they have gotten by saying no. This is a culture in which yes is just a knee-jerk response to opportunities, to service, this for many reasons. And I think that people have to, as they progress in their careers, it seems, unlearn saying yes as an instinctual response and finding ways to say no without the guilt or the sense of pulling away. And there are the extra clinical demands, but even clinically speaking, finding ways to set limits within the flow of work is also important and difficult given the workload and the sense of leaving a burden to others that people feel. I don't think this is just workaholism and people are addicted to working. I think people feel it seems an intense responsibility for meeting the demands of the system and it can become very difficult for people to set those limits. One of the things that I find very useful is if someone's asking you to do something specific, then at the end of your email response or whatever it may be is to offer them another person, even be a better choice than yourself for that particular thing. Because at least that doesn't leave them like, oh, they said no, now I'm screwed. Now they have someone else that they can go to. And hopefully that person is incredibly passionate about the thing that they're being asked to do and will do it. (laughs) (laughs) All right. We touched a little bit upon how social media can be very distracting. And in trying to get this sort of work-life balance thing happening, are there any specific strategies you can use, sort of unplugging strategies, so to speak, in case you're finding that you're being overwhelmed by emails and social media and just constantly on your phone and you can't get anything done and you're ignoring your family because you're checking your emails. I just find for me, time away from my phone is really valuable. And so now I've sort of moved to a system where if I'm working in my office, I will leave my phone in the other room because otherwise it beeps and whistles and distracts me with all sorts of different things. And if I'm working on my laptop on a specific program, I'll make sure my email is closed and my calendar or any other distractions are closed so I don't have a window there actively showing me how many more emails I have to respond to. Because having that time to just focus directly is really important for my productivity and my concentration. Yeah, there's this great book called Deep Work that was kind of flying through Twitter for a while there that I read that talks about all this stuff uh, Mm -hmm. and in more detail. And it's a fantastic book. I highly recommend it to people who do find themselves getting distracted from being able to do deep work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the things I do is I used to have my cell phone next to my bed before I went to sleep. And then, you know, it beeps and you pick it up. And then the next thing you know, you've spent 45 minutes where you could have been sleeping. And we'll talk about how important sleep is in a little bit. And instead, you've just gotten all that blue light and then you have difficulty falling asleep. So now I keep my phone on the opposite side of my bedroom. And the first thing I do in the morning, rather than looking at my emails, is I meditate for 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. And that, that gets me going in the morning and keeps me undistracted for sure. The other thing I do is I actually schedule, you're talking about the schedule hack. I schedule time for emails and social media. So rather than just constantly being on Twitter or constantly looking at your emails, you just schedule a specific time each day that you're going to be on Twitter or check your emails. At this point, we've covered failing up. We've talked about taking care of yourself. Next on the list of individual strategies is self-compassion training and an attempt to enhance one's emotional intelligence. This sound, might sound a little bit weird, but Sarah, can you tell us a little bit about how self-compassion training and learning how to enhance your emotional intelligence might promote wellness? So when I decided I needed to start living differently, I started reading all these books about failure. And so many of those books that talked about thriving after failure or even coping with failure talked about 
the importance of the concept of self-compassion. And so that concept just means being kind to yourself, treating yourself with the same kindness and respect that you would treat your best friend. And that's not only in making sure your wellness strategies are all in place, but also trying to teach your inner voice to be kind to yourself. So we all have our own inner voice, I think, whether you listen to it or not. But if I, you know, spill coffee on my white t-shirt or trip on the subway stairs or do something else, you know, visibly ridiculous, my inner voice is very critical and judgmental and sarcastic. And I think this is quite common among medical professionals. Don't forget the series of expletives. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. And my my inner voice voice can seriously swear. Yeah. Yeah. An excellent command of profanity. (laughs) But you can train in self-compassion and train to treat yourself more kindly, both on the inside and sort of externally through our wellness behavior. And this can be really valuable in recovering after failure. So I understand that there's actually evidence out there that the more compassionate you are to yourself, the better ability you'll have to be compassionate to other people, to your patients, to your friends, to your family. Absolutely. So this is highly correlated And so there's excellent evidence to show that you can only be as compassionate with your patients as you are with yourself. And so if you tend to be highly judgmental and critical on the inside, then there is an excellent chance that you are also highly judgmental and critical of your patients' behaviors and choices. Whether or not you express that is separate, but certainly those thought patterns track together. And... Most doctors, in fact, are not very good at self-compassion. And so training in this can not only help us internally with how we cope with failure, but I think it can actually make us better doctors. We can be more compassionate and more connected with patients and their families. That's ultimately what gives you a lot of satisfaction in being a doctor in general. You know, whether you're an emergency physician or any kind of physician, if you can get an emotional connection with your patient and you can tell by the end of the interaction that they're truly thankful so often has more to do with how compassionate you are than whether you made the right diagnosis or you chose the right imaging study or you gave the right medication, et cetera. Absolutely. I just want to talk a a little bit about kind of specific strategies here. So I've been working on this myself, actually. Just this morning, I was pulling the milk out of the fridge to add to my coffee, and a whole bunch of stuff just came falling out of the fridge onto the floor. And I can tell you, five years ago, I for sure would have had a series of profanities and blaming myself, and I'm such an idiot, and how could I do this? And this morning, I'm proud to say that I looked at all the stuff on the floor, and I actually started laughing it was kind of like, ha, huh, how did I actually do that? Let's see. Hmm. And how can we get all this stuff back in there so that my wife doesn't see how I've just broken a few jars <laughs> 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 of her favorite jam? And this is something I've actually needed to train myself to do. Mm-hmm. So can you suggest how our listeners can actually train themselves to be more self-compassionate? Yeah. So I started just by paying attention to your inner voice, because I wasn't actually really familiar with that concept when I first started learning about this. So I spent ages just hearing what I say to myself on the inside, and then I was a little bit appalled. So then I started trying to practice saying it more kindly. So it will still happen that I will, that I'll spill coffee on myself. That's my most common example, because I think I do that all the time. And routinely, my inner voice will say something like, oh, Sarah, Damn it, you know, you did it again. Sorry, you can bleep that. And then I'll say to myself, Sarah, it's okay. This has happened to everybody. This is not a big deal. This is a normal human mistake. Let's carry on with the day. And then I carry on with my day. But I don't end up in that cycle of blame or self-judgment. 
And so for me, it's a constant mental practice of trying to reframe, remembering those components of self-compassion. But there's actually all sorts of different ways to train on this. There's books you can read. There are specific self-compassion meditations around this. There's self-compassion journaling. So I often direct people to Kristen Neff's website, which is selfcompassion.org. She's a researcher in the United States whose primary focus is on self-compassion, and she has an amazing range of work on her website, but also lots of resources for people who are interested in, in getting better or or interested in learning about this. And so I have no affiliation with her website, but I found it to be a really valuable resource for people who are interested in this concept. All right, yeah, we'll have that link in the show notes for sure. So we've talked about a few of these great strategies, talking about how to fail up, taking care of yourself, these self-compassion strategies. The next one I want to talk about is mindfulness techniques or grounding techniques. Chris, What are mindfulness techniques and grounding techniques? You know, it all sounds a little bit airy-fairy, but how can this actually be useful for people to promote their their own wellness? Well, Anton, I think it flows quite well from Sarah's discussion on self-compassion because as she was pointing out, self-compassion hinges on the ability to notice what voice is active at any given point in time. And, it, and oftentimes those voices are not fully conscious that we actually are are feeling certain ways and choosing certain actions without having a full awareness of exactly what's happening inside our minds. And so mindfulness is really at the heart of self-compassion as understood in that way, that to catch ourselves, to notice that thinking, to not identify with that voice, but to look at alternatives, to reframe, requires a presence of mind, a mindfulness that makes an alternate outcome possible. So mindfulness is simply defined as the practice of paying attention on purpose in the present moment. And so it's a deliberate focus on what's happening, both in one's mind, in one's thoughts, emotions, but also externally, sounds, physical sensations. So it's a global attention and awareness to what's happening without an attempt to fix or change or alter what's happening. So there's an emphasis on acceptance of what's happening. It's not to say that we might not want to later make interventions on some of the things that come up for us or some of the thoughts or ruminations. But in the practice of mindfulness, the emphasis is on simply being aware. And I think going back to self-compassion again, this idea of not identifying with our mistakes or our shortcomings, for example, becomes an important outgrowth of mindfulness. Because one of the things that research has tracked around mindfulness is that people over time who practice mindfulness tend to shift in the way that they identify in their self-understanding. So, for example, we might tell ourselves stories about who we are or we might get caught up in who we imagine others see us to be and sort of get caught up in this narrative about the self. And you can hear that in Sarah saying, oh, I'm such a bleep for doing this, for spilling your wife's jam, that we make a conclusion about who we are and identify with the story. Mindfulness is inviting us to actually identify with our present experience, not with a story about ourselves, but the present moment, whatever this is, this sense in our bodies, this sense in our minds, and even to notice that voice, but not identifying with it to identify with awareness itself. So it's a, it's quite a radical shift that supports some of these changes in how compassionate we can be with ourselves, how grounded we can be in the midst of activity, even activity that's stressful. And so mindfulness is about bringing that awareness into one's day-to-day living, into one's work, into the most gnarly aspects of our lives. So that's a really good explanation of how mindfulness works So things like meditating can help improve your mindfulness, which is easier said than done. It takes a lot of practice. (laughs) I don't think there's any sort of easy way to learn mindfulness. It's something that happens over time. But what are some resources that some of our listeners could go to if they're interested in being more mindful? So there are books people could read about it. There are lots of meditations that people can either do on their own or there are guided exercises that you can download from the internet or from YouTube. There are apps that you can use. There are many different meditation apps available for people to practice with. Or it can even just be as simple as 
sitting somewhere for five minutes with your eyes shut, just trying to focus on your breathing. I know when I first started meditating, I couldn't go more than two minutes sitting still, focusing on my breathing. Like, I just couldn't even stand it. I would get distracted. I would get irritable. I'm a little bit ADHD anyway at baseline. But if you continue to practice, you can build up the time that you're able to maintain that focus and that awareness on your present moment. And then it becomes a skill set you can tap into whenever you need during the day. And maybe it's just a moment of focusing on your breathing or a moment of box breathing, which is getting increasingly popular sort of in the resuscitation literature of how to prepare yourself before a difficult resuscitation comes in. But you can then have that skill set that you can access over the day when you find yourself in a difficult moment. Yeah, I mean, I find I use just deep breathing so often, even during shift, whether it's I get a call in that there's a cardiac arrest coming in, even before my shift, I try and do a bit of deep breathing just before I start. When I have a difficult patient interaction, I'll do some deep breathing. Even like while I'm in the difficult interaction, I'll let the patient talk and kind of do my own deep breathing while they're doing that. And I find it makes a world of difference. Absolutely. Being able to stay mindful through that difficult patient or family interaction really allows me to be much more balanced in my response and a lot less reactive in how I engage with the families and the patients. It makes a huge difference for me too. One of the things I would stress also about mindfulness is that people often tell me that they're not very good at it. And I think you both stressed that it is obviously a practice that takes time and, and evolves as one continues to engage if one chooses to. But I think that that's a barrier for a lot of people that they sit down and you said as much, Sarah, that you notice your mind jumping all over the place. And if one is aware of a jumpy mind, one is being mindful, that it's not about the content. And I think people think that mindfulness is only working or they're only doing it correctly if they're feeling calm. But mindfulness is actually just awareness of what's happening, which could be chaos, <laughs> which could be feeling very unsettled. And it's just that deliberate attention and awareness. And it sounds, I mean, it's deceptively simple, but at the same time, as soon as we engage in it, we are doing it. And measuring our progress in it can be a major barrier, especially within a perfectionistic culture like medicine, where a lot of physicians tell me, oh, I've tried that, but I'm no good at it. Well, 99.9% .9 of mindfulness is just showing up. And I think that that's an important encouragement for people who want to try to practice for two minutes and then see if they can carry it over into their activity. But I think wherever we start, as one mindfulness teacher has put it, there you are. And it's really about starting there. So. Good point. Right? We can fail at meditation and learn from that. Absolutely. Right? There you go. It's as, a as part of our fail. road yeah, of recovering right. from our perfectionism. There's it's no all coming full circle. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We haven't touched on the term resilience yet. And this is a word that is thrown around a lot in not only in emergency medicine, but in kids' schools and in popular media. You know, it comes up when talking about keeping calm during a resuscitation that's not going so well, for example. Chris, in the context of preventing burnout and promoting wellness, first, let's define like what is resilience and then how can we train ourselves to be more resilient to help improve our wellness? Resilience is really the ability to bounce back. So we face some adversity. There's no resilience without adversity. Adversity happens and can we recover and can we continue and regain our momentum or even grow from that adversity? But I think what is important to stress is that sometimes people use the concept of resilience to beat themselves up, to think that it's kind of an inherent congenital factor that they either have or they do not have. And they look around and they think their peers have more of it. It's And they think of it like grit. It's the ability to kind of endure or persevere. But I think the literature more and more is pointing to the fact that resilience is really a set of skills that can be learned. And more than anything, it hinges on the ability to reach out 
and seek resources as they are needed. So it has a, a few parts. One is the ability to self-monitor and know what your needs are, and then the ability to identify how you will get those needs met and then go ahead and do that. So rather than having this go-it-alone approach as one's frame for thinking about resilience, I think it's very important, especially in this medical culture, to emphasize reaching out as a key skill in building and sustaining one's resilience. I think the key for me is to work to identify what parts of my job I feel passionate about. Like if I find the thing I love, then working on it actually often doesn't feel like work. It feels like fun because I enjoy it so much and because I am so engaged in it. So I always recommend to people that they explicitly start identifying what do they love about their work What are those moments where they don't even notice time passing because they're so deep into it? And then once you know clearly what you're passionate about and the pieces you love, then you start strategizing, how can I increase those things in my work? And how can I decrease the things that I am less engaged with? And this circles back a little bit to our boundary setting conversation. Maybe you need to say no to a few things that you're not passionate and engaged with. And that opens up more time for you to spend your energies on the things that you love. And realigning your work in that way, I, for me, is a constant process as my interests wax and wane or my the amount of time I have for work changes as life changes. But continuing to reevaluate those things on a regular basis and making sure you're still trying to focus on the parts you love help keep me engaged. Yeah, it's interesting you say that, you know, just from the work that I do with EM cases, people ask me all the time, you know, how do you have time for all that work? And doesn't that work just burn you out? And my answer is basically that, well, I don't even like podcasting is fun. I love it. Like it's not work to me. I think it's interesting, you know, the idea of work-life balance as if work is some one thing and life is another thing. And work is often seen as this bad thing and then life Mm -hmm. is the good thing. Mm -hmm. But I don't know, for me at least, I have a passion for podcasting. I don't see it as work. I just see it as part of life. And actually there aren't too many things I'd rather be doing than (laughs) podcasting. So yeah, I, I think that's so important to try and identify what you're passionate about. You know, this is one of the strategies that you can use when you're on that spectrum of burnout. If you are a little bit burnt out, trying to refocus on the parts of your job where you feel really engaged may help shift you back to the safer or healthier side of that curve. Now, if you've already gone as far on the spectrum as clinical depression or addiction, you're going to need a number of other strategies as well, right? Re-engaging is not going to be adequate. But all of these things we've talked about are strategies that can help overall improve our wellness. It's not only engagement on an individual level, but I know that colleagues of mine who have engaged in in helping the department, their ED, for example, you know, helping to improve your emergency department will make you feel a lot better about working in that emergency department. And if everyone pitches in and helps out to improve their department in some way, Mm -hmm. that's when you get the camaraderie and you get that support network at work where you feel like you can talk to people and it just kind of snowballs into this whole positive thing rather than this isolation and things getting worse and worse. Mm -hmm. To put some numbers to this, there was some interesting research at the Mayo Clinic where they actually looked at this number of 20% of activity of a physician's time spent on something they were passionate about or areas that they were passionate about was enough to protect against burnout. And everything under 20%, for each percentage point under 20% of one's time, feeling engaged, feeling absorbed in the work, burnout was increased. What was interesting was that for every percentage point above 20, 
it did not provide further protection against burnout. So it's interesting that whether you're doing 50% of your time is something that you feel very passionate about, didn't seem to protect you any more than 20%. And so that's interesting organizationally, that it's one thing for the individual worker to identify that these are areas that they would be more passionate about, but actually finding ways to work with the organization to make sure that you have time dedicated to that. And that's important for leadership and administration to think about, support workers by making sure workers have at least 20% of their time on something that they feel very passionate about. And then they're going to be willing to do 80% of their time on something that they might not be quite as thrilled about and still be able to uh, protect themselves from burnout. Oh, those are some interesting numbers. I guess, you know, the 60% of the time I spend doing the podcast, maybe I should cut back a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> maybe you're going to get a pay cut. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One other, I think, danger of focusing on resilience in the wrong way, but focusing on it at all, actually, is that it can put the onus on the individual physician. And that when we're looking at burnout and we're looking at numbers of upwards of 50% of practicing physicians in the United States feeling burnt out, that's a systems level issue. And putting the responsibility back on the individual to skill up, do more mindfulness, do more exercise, find ways of reflecting, schedule hacking, all of those are obviously important and put the internal locus of control back in the physician's hands, which is important. But if we're only looking at the individual level, it can breed resentment. And you get people who sort of feel like, oh, here's another program aimed at my resilience. You just want to make me more resilient so you can make me work harder. And there's a sense that really what's required is an intervention and interventions that are going to address these systemic factors rather than just focusing on the individual. And the other danger is that oftentimes people will then measure themselves on their resilience and it can be another competency to fall short on. (laughs) Another way that physicians feel that they haven't quite measured up if the emphasis is on them coping as individuals rather than looking at this organizationally and systemically. Mm -hmm. So we're going to be talking a lot about systems issues and how we can fix those. And there is a lot of overlap. The final thing I want to talk about from an individual perspective, an individual strategy also overlaps with systems issues. And that is uh, sleep hygiene. You know, it overlaps with system issues because of, you know, the way your department is scheduled, for example. Let's talk about individual things first that you can do, and later we can talk about some of the systems things to improve sleep. I mean, we all know that when we haven't slept properly, and especially if we're doing shift work, that we can get grumpy and that we don't perform well when we're sleep deprived. Sarah, what are some of the quick tips you can give for people to improve their quality of sleep? So... Part of that is just how you set up your bedroom. Ideally, you want to make sure you have a space that is dark. You want it to be quiet. You want it to be free from interruptions, like a door you can close or lock so that the rest of your household can still live their lives outside of your sleep. Many people use white noise machines to help decrease distractions, or people can sleep with earplugs. And then I find for me... I am very susceptible to the blue light from screens. So I need to have at least half an hour or an hour with no screens before I go to sleep. And I have to be pretty careful with caffeine or with alcohol if I want to have a good sleep. So I pay attention to when I'm drinking caffeine and when I stop drinking compared to when I want to have my sleep. So it doesn't keep me awake. And I find if I have a significant amount of alcohol, I don't sleep well either. So I am pretty careful about that. Yeah. I mean, all, all those things are backed up by pretty good evidence, actually. Any other tips on, on good sleep habits? I think that actively engaging in pre-sleep rituals like those that Sarah has mentioned can be very helpful for people. And there are also guided sleep exercises, mindfulness sleep exercises that can help people wind down. I think I've heard from many Physicians that are coming home after a a late shift or post-call, they can have a hard time actually getting the shut eye and it takes them time to kind of come down and actually pre-sleep rituals can help with that and there are lots of those online. MIT actually has gathered some specifically for physicians and they have it on their website and that's something people find very helpful. Okay, great. Yeah, we can put a link on the website. What about napping? My understanding is that if... You nap for 10 minutes, that can be really invigorating. But if you nap for 
say 30 minutes that actually can make you more tired when you wake up. And if you nap for an hour and a half, that kind of goes along with your circadian rhythm. That's about an hour and a half that Mm -hmm. that can be invigorating as well. Mm -hmm. So power napping is not to be underestimated. And there is research in healthcare providers, physicians and nurses that, as you say, Anton, up to 10 minutes can make uh, measurable differences in accuracy and speed on different tasks right through until morning. So if people are nappers and feel like they could take 10 minutes but aren't sure of its value, then they can consider this, that actually it can make a big difference in how one performs post-nap. And your point about napping too long but not long enough, sort of that uh, unsweet spot of about 30 minutes, is connected with what's called sleep inertia, which is this period after waking from a nap of about that length that's 20 to 30 minutes long where performance and cognition is actually about the same as 24 hours of continuous wakefulness. So many physicians are familiar with this being startled when they get a call or when they're woken up and the functioning is low for a time. And I know physicians who avoid naps for that very reason. But if you can get in that sweet spot about 10 minutes, napping is something to be considered as a resource. I can't describe the feeling when I'm in my bed asleep and then I wake up with a vision blurred And all my efforts are deterred We've been talking a lot about individual strategies to prevent burnout and promote wellness. Let's get onto the system strategies. And there's several that I'd like to talk about. There's role modeling or mentoring, which we've touched on. There's leadership support and appreciation, you know, creating a supportive culture. There's ice cream rounds, which we'll explain what they are in a minute. There's the idea of the early warning system for near misses in terms of medical error. There's Coming back to the sleep is, you know, having circadian rhythm friendly shift scheduling and there's hospital resources like we touched upon earlier, like sleep rooms and exercise facilities, things like that. So let's start off with role modeling and finding a mentor. How can role modeling actually promote wellness, Chris? Having role models within the community who emphasize self-care and who speak openly about the challenges that are ubiquitous within the medical community can make a huge difference in normalizing those concerns and normalizing the need to cope and manage those actively. And so that cuts down on isolation and it creates a sense of community of support. I think it's closely connected with Sarah's comment about the failure friend. That's a perfect example of creating a sense of connection. That can be a horizontal peer, but if we can have mentors who are specifically geared towards supporting the wellness of physicians, I think that would be a huge step forward rather than just mentors who are about career advancement or academic advancement or clinical knowledge, but actually mentors you can turn to who can share their stories about how they manage the exact same struggles at different points in their career. And that leadership from within and that peer mentoring, I think, as it's been measured, has made a big difference in the context that it's been emphasized. Oh, that's interesting. I mean, you know, traditionally, People think of mentors as I have, this is my mentor and I have this one mentor, but I really like the idea of having different mentors for different purposes. I know myself, I have three or four different mentors and I'll go to them for different things. Chris, I understand that you run something called ice cream rounds for the emergency residents at University of Toronto. That's right. Yeah, can you describe how that works and, you know, what the what the philosophy is behind it and what kind of feedback you're getting about it? Sure. So the ice cream rounds that I was a part of, and actually Sarah was a part of as well, in emergency medicine last year, were an adaptation from the broader format of ice cream rounds. And we sort of, it was a bit innovative. Actually, ice cream rounds, as it's been done in many contexts, are an opportunity for trainees to come together over ice cream and talk about the less sweet and the unsavory parts of their experience 
but to do it in a constructive way while they're enjoying something sweet. What we did was actually to introduce a couple of other elements. First off, we invited a leader, a senior staff, a practicing physician to come and share a story related to a theme about their own medical journey and their own wellness. So it could have been about managing failure. It could have been about uh, transitions within their medical journey. And to have a leader come forward and self-disclose something that they'd struggled with and the way that they were able to work through those challenges. And then for that physician to step back, either leave or take a back seat as there was a facilitated follow-up conversation with guided reflection with the trainees on the same theme. And we did that over the course of the year. And the themes were transitions and managing failure and managing fatigue, mindfulness. And so in each theme, there was an opportunity for both the trainees to hear from a leader and also for the trainees to speak with each other about how they were managing these aspects of their experience and to have delicious ice cream. So, Wow. Congratulations. That, that sounds like a great program. I'm, I'm going to volunteer for that one. <laughs> <laughs> right. And I, I think, Anton... Not only is that a great program for our residents, but maybe that should be a program that we have for staff, right? Why isn't, you know, once a year, maybe at a minimum, why don't we have that as eMERGE groups? Rather than having M&M rounds, have an ice cream rounds. Because I think the wellness of our senior staff is just as valuable, as, of course, as that of the trainees. But there's no reason why we should roll out these initiatives just for them, right? We should be adopting all of these great ideas and incorporating them for everybody. Sarah, you had touched a bit earlier on how having to keep up with the hospital metrics can be sometimes burdensome and actually be a contributor to burnout. You know, it seems that with every new software system implemented in the ED, the docs are burdened with an ever-increasing number of tasks to complete on shifts. And I remember a couple of years ago, Stuart Swadron was giving a talk at EMU and suggested that, you know, being chained to our computers and forced to abide by protocols and algorithms constantly in the ED contributes to burnout because rather than spending time with the patients, we're actually just sitting at computers checking off boxes. Sir, what's your take on this? I mean, what do you suggest on a systems level? You know, QI is very important and has its benefits for sure. But if there was an ideal sort of system that you would see in the ED, what would it look like? Great. So, and you sort of raised two issues there. One is the issue around how increasingly physicians are shackled to their computers. And this is a system problem. This is an issue where we need our hospital leadership and our emergency department leadership to really advocate for efficient and effective systems for their docs to use and their nurses to use. I mean, we all interact with our electronic medical records and our ordering systems. Having a bad system makes everybody's day worse because we didn't sign up for medicine to spend all day typing in front of a computer. And it's not really where doctors are at their best. And the second part of your question was around people feeling trapped in that I must follow this preprinted order set or I must follow that guideline. And I think you want to walk the fine balance there between giving healthcare workers tools to deliver optimal bedside care, but still allowing them the freedom to practice the art of medicine. And so I think it's really valuable for people to have a tool that they can use as a starting point where they can choose whether or not to tick the boxes and they can choose how to individualize it for that patient with explicitly being clear that they are allowed to alter it to match the patient situation as they need. You talked briefly about individual strategies to improve your sleep. There's also systems issues that contribute to how well you're going to sleep or how poorly you're going to sleep when it comes to shift scheduling. Mm. Could you just briefly tell us about casino shifts and also about scheduling forward? Those two concepts, casino shifting and scheduling forward and how those can help with all the physicians sleep and improve their performance and prevent burnout. Sure. So the first concept is casino shifts, which is rather than your night shift being, say, from midnight until 8 a.m., 
you would divide that shift up. And so the first person usually typically would start at 10 p.m. and work until 4 a.m. And at 4, they would hand over to the person doing the late half of it, which would be from 4 a.m. to 10 a.m. The benefit to this is that you preserve some of your anchor sleep, which is the concept of some of your sleep happening at the normal time you would be sleeping. So if you're working the early half of the casino, you'd still be home by, say, 5 a.m. and have some overlap sleep with your normal time. And the converse is true if you're working the late half. This also means when you leave at 4 a.m., you're going home in the dark and can hopefully get to sleep before that daylight resets your circadian rhythm. And for the person who starts at 4 a.m., they're starting in the dark, but the light's going to turn on, daylight's going to arrive Mm -hmm. as they're at work. So this is both thought to help maintain your normal circadian rhythm and be a little easier to recover from. It actually started in casinos, hence the name, who wanted to make sure that the people dealing the cards were wide awake and alert. And, you know, that level of alertness is found when people do these shorter shifts that are more physiologic. So that's casino shifting, which I know in our department, we went to casino shifting a few years back. And as far as I know, every department in Toronto who has gone from the classic overnight shift that starts at midnight and ends at 8 a.m. to casino shifts, none of them have gone back to doing the classic (laughs) overnight shift. Mm. It seems like everyone is in agreement that they're really great. The second concept there was scheduling forward. How does that work? Right. So this is that your sequential shifts over a period of a few days should move forward in time, not backwards. So ideally, you should go from a day shift to an evening to a night rather than a day and then a night, and then an evening. Mm -hmm. And this is also to keep it in line with our normal circadian rhythms. And so it turns out that naturally our normal sleep-wake cycle would drift a little bit later each day anyway. And so it is easier for us to move our shifts forward and still feel good rather than moving in the opposite direction. All right, yeah. And I know that there are some companies out there that provide software that have algorithms that automatically integrate some of these ideas for scheduling. They do cost money, and I have no financial ties with any of them, but at our place, we do have a scheduling system like that that works brilliantly, and everyone seems to be very happy with it. All right, so the last item on our list for system strategies to promote wellness are hospital resources. Sarah, what kind of hospital resources can help us? I'm imagining a hospital in some sort of utopia where you have like a beautiful gym and a massage room and an outdoor indoor where you can go, uh, I don't know, swimming. Um, oh, that'd be great. <laughs> Sounds very Scandinavian. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So within, within reason, knowing that hospital budgets are always tight, what are some kind of hospital resources that might promote wellness? So you make a good point, Anton. Hospital resources are tight, and we want to spend our dollars effectively. But I am really looking forward to the next few years of evidence on healthcare worker wellness, because I believe that if we built hospitals to help their workers be more well, that would result in fewer sick days, less disability time, more productivity on shift, and I think the hospital would get their money back by having a healthier workforce. Now, I can't prove that to you, but I believe that to be true. And here are the types of things I would love to see in new hospitals that are being built. Why don't we have sleep rooms for physicians who have just finished a night shift so they can nap for a couple hours if they need to before they do their long commute home, or for nurses, for that matter, who do their 12-hour nights. I think we should have rooms available where staff could sleep and regroup as they needed. I think hospitals should include child care options for staff who need a safe child care option so that you don't have health care workers calling in sick because, in fact, it is their child that is sick or unwell. I think hospitals should include gyms, maybe not the indoor-outdoor pool, or at least not in Toronto. But why not give your workers an opportunity to engage in exercise on their break? 
Like, why don't we want a healthier, stronger workforce? It doesn't have to be a huge space. But giving people that opportunity and even the reminder to your staff that you think their health and exercise is important enough that you've put it into your building is a really valuable statement. And then I personally find myself distressed by the increasing numbers of hospitals that only have fast food available for workers to buy. Donuts and pizza. Donuts and pizza. And many of them only have food available during bankers' hours, as if people only work there Monday to Friday from 8 to 4. I think hospitals must have 24-7 healthy food options for the people inside. Like, I think half of our workforce is there at night. There's no reason why everything should be shut at night or your only option is the coffee shop to get something at those hours. I think that's unacceptable in this day and age and that hospitals should be considering those pieces of their design, not only for patients and families who may also need nutrition overnight, but more importantly, for the health of their workforce. I would add to that that there's actually growing evidence that taking the time And these are not huge investments, but taking the time and the resources to address physician health would more than pay back the return on investment in terms of uh, protecting people's work, worker retention. In fact, one study looking at, in the United States at least, the costs of replacing a lost physician were two to three times the salary of that physician over the course of a year for the system. And so... We're talking about small investments on a range that have a huge return in terms of the functioning of the system. And so these things do, I think, need to be considered as well worth the investment. Thank you so much, Sarah and Chris, for your insights into preventing burnout and promoting wellness. I think this one will go down in the history books as something that people might come back to again and again whenever they're feeling like they might be uh, slipping down that route on burnout. Pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for having me. To wrap up, I'd like to take a moment to tell you a personal story. Many years ago, my cousin, who was a pediatric emergency physician and a wonderful human being, committed suicide in her kitchen by injecting herself with potassium chloride after having a long, hard battle with burnout and depression. I'm quite sure that she would not have sunk so low if it were 2017. If it were 2017, with our newfound interest and attention to wellness, maybe she would have had the insight, support, and resources to climb out of her depression before it took hold of her. Just maybe she would have enjoyed a long, successful career and been a happy wife and mother. One of the benefits of creating podcasts for me has been to learn intimately how the art and science of EM progresses forward. In the same way that medicine evolves, so too should those who practice it. The time for physicians to suffer in silence is over. We're fortunate to be practicing in the beginning of the wellness era, but this also comes with a new responsibility. I believe that it's our duty to take care of ourselves and to take care of one another. It's time for bravado to die, not our colleagues. Let's continue on this road of promoting wellness and preventing burnout so that we can all have successful careers and happy home lives. You know, my usual podcast sign-off has probably never been more apt. Until next time, take it easy. (laughs) 